I'm a cultural heritage consultant, but in the interest of full disclosure, I also work as a consultant at the Smithsonian, which is why I'm here introducing this session. Um, you'll notice we have a really cumbersome hashtag, <laughs> but I'm going to ask you to please use it if you're tweeting. Also use the MCN 2012 hashtag so people can find it both ways. Um, I want to start with a little bit of uh, context for what the panelists are going to talk about. And by doing that, I'm going to give you a backstory going up to 2009 about the, the status of digitization at the Smithsonian up to this point. Um, in a word, it was, there was a lot of digitization, and it was extremely uncoordinated. And this slide kind of expresses what was happening. Lots of work, no progress. Because the digitization was all very one-off, project-specific. It helped particular individuals who needed it at that time. But it wasn't moving the institution forward in terms of making these assets more broadly available. At that point, we had a CIO named Ann Spire who decided that these random acts of digitization, as she called them, really had to stop or at least be better coordinated. So she made it her mission to introduce planning and coordination and the whole concept of scaling up the level of quality and quantity of digital assets across the institution. As she was pursuing this mission, a few years later, a series of activities took place which helped push it forward on the agenda of the institution, one of which was we got a new leader in 2008. Um, the director of the Smithsonian is called the secretary. And so we got Secretary Wayne Clough, who came in, like all new leaders, with a new agenda and a new series of questions. And on that agenda and in those questions were digitization. Where is the institution in terms of how much of the collection is digitized? At what quality? At what level of fidelity? Um, what's available for people to use? And those questions couldn't be easily answered. Also in 2010, the institution developed its first ever digitization strategic plan, which is available should you want to see it. It's publicly available. It has a lot of um, goals and objectives, as all strategic plans do, but the important outputs from this particular plan were twofold. They established um, a digitization program office at the institution, which is kind of a central office in a very decentralized place that was set up to advocate for digitization across the institution and to push it forward in a way that would increase the quantity and quality of the digital assets across the institution. We also got the first ever digitization policy stating that digitization is a resource just like personnel and facilities and collections, and it really has to be managed in that way as well. So that was important. Also in 2010, we had the development of our web and new media strategy, which was a, a, the next step. Once you have digital assets, how do you deliver them in a way that's effective and will, in, will encourage engagement? And in 2011, we have what we call the digitization assessment, which is the first ever inventory of the digital assets at the institution. So there was lots of work going on in a very short period of time. And although this is very impressive, it is really nothing compared to what we call the big challenge, which is how do you scale up the rate of digitization in an institution that has this, an incredible diversity of collections types? You have living collections, panda bears. You have static collections. You have these collections in different formats, audio, visual, data, um, text. And you have a lot of them. 139 million objects was the latest count in the 70s, I believe of the objects at the Smithsonian. And they're distributed over 19 museums, nine research centers, a library that has 12 branches, 20. 20 branches. And all of these places also have archives individually. So you're talking um, an incredible assemblage that has to be dealt with here. So today you're going to hear a story about how the Smithsonian is addressing this challenge. And the institution has made a deep commitment now to massively ramping up digitization of the collections so that they can be made accessible and foster greater engagement um, among its audiences. And our three speakers today are going to talk about this in various ways. Um, I guess this isn't working, but that's OK. Um, how the institution is scoping out such a big challenge, some of the new technologies they're looking at to help them with capture of the metadata and the surrogates that are involved in digitizing, and then looking at where 3D digitization figures into all of this. So I'll go with our speakers here, and I 
I'm going to have to ad lib your um, bios because. Make it up. Okay. It's much more interesting than <laughs> Our first speaker is Gunter Rival. Gunter is um, big cheese, I guess, if I have to make it up. He's the one who's going to talk about the institution's approach to this in, in a conceptual way. Um, he's was brought to the digitization program office in 2010, I believe, and he says he eats, dreams, and sleeps um, digitization <laughs> and how to ramp it up at the Smithsonian. Then we have Rebecca Snyder, who next to him should speak next. She's our digital media specialist at the National Museum of Natural History. Um, Rebecca started out working on 3D digitization with a project called Digital Triceratops, and then moved more into um, preservation and analysis of digital materials. And she works at the largest unit at the Smithsonian, which is the Natural History Museum, and has the bulk of that 139 million collection. Um, and she's going to talk about how what Gunter's organizing in terms of conceptual ideas, how that plays out within a unit at the unit level. And our last speaker is what I'm going to call our ace in the hole. This is Adam Metallo. He's doing some really wildly neat stuff with 3D digitization. He has some great projects to talk about, some wonderful images. So I would like you to all stay till the end so you can see that. And he'll talk about 3D digitization. And he comes from the, um, help me with this, the exhibits. Yep, uh, exhibits, uh, model making. Model making world. And he moved that in to 3D digitization and now is the 3D digitization coordinator yeah, at the digitization program office. And without, everybody's going to have 20 minutes to speak and then we'll have Q&A. And so without further ado, I'm going to play musical chairs with Gunter here. So nice ad living. Yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> That was great. Thanks, Diane. Okay. Bear with me while I find my way here. So as Diane said, I'm Gunter Weibel, I'm the director of the Digitization Program Office at the Smithsonian, and I'm here to talk to you about how we can put the digital into We Are the Smithsonian. Um, Diane also already outlined to you sort of the, the scale of that challenge sort of in the broadest sense, and I'm just going to briefly reiterate that. You already heard about this sort of organizational scale of the challenge, and which is a shorthand for all the different ambitions we also have at the, at the Smithsonian. Another way of looking at this are the numbers of collections. Diane mentioned the 139 million collection objects number. There's another number that doesn't get mentioned that often. In addition to those 139 million collection objects, we also have 130,000 cubic feet of archival materials. If you stack those boxes side to side, that's 26 miles of boxes. So that's substantial as well. And here's yet another facet of that challenge, thinking about how is this how are these collections physically located? We have 41 facilities housing these collections in approximately 1,800 rooms. Um, a lot of this uh, happens on the mall, but there's also a lot of this that's outside of the mall. I just put them all up um, because it's a nice sort of uh, <coughs> thumbnail sketch. Um, contrary to what you he heard at the movies and Night at the Museum, the National Gallery is not part of the Smithsonian, despite the fact that it's also on my screenshot here. Just thought I'd clarify that in case there was doubt. So I'm here to really tell you a story. If you have a big challenge like that, what you need is a good story that you can talk about that's credible and that you can quote unquote sell, that you can get people excited about, that you can get funders excited about. So the parts of my story, and it's a very simple, simplistic story, very basic, um, are where are we? Before we start, we got to figure out where we actually stand, and that means can we understand what we have already digitized? So I'll introduce you to uh, some statistics and metrics we now have that give us a good snapshot of where we're currently at. Next, we need to know where do we want to go. Um, that has a lot to do with what we want to digitize next and with priorities we need to set. And then last but not least, how do we get there? Um, and that question is really all about how do we organize ourselves in the most effective way around this challenge. With a challenge of that scale, um, even sort of small inefficiencies have a huge, huge impact at the end of the day. And this is where my presentation will become rather wifty and uh, sort of uh, aspirational because this idea of how to organize ourselves, that's the part we're currently working through. And I 
have some thoughts on that for you, but uh, nothing too concrete, so you'll have to bear with me at that point. This used to be our story. Uh, when the secretary arrived at the Smithsonian three months after he got there, he gave an interview saying, the Smithsonian will digitize its full collections. And um, I think he actually never really intended to say that. What he really intended to say, <laughs> what he really intended to say was, we've got huge collections, we should make a huge amount of impact, and that means we need to digitize a whole bunch of this stuff. We need to think big. Um, I don't think he meant to say we need to digitize every single scrap in our collections. Um, so part of what I've been trying to do from the day I got to the Smithsonian was to to put some bones on this story. What is it actually that we need to do? What are the contours of this challenge in a much more concrete fashion? So I'll walk you through a, um, a couple of slides that have some of the statistics about uh, where we're currently at. So we, we formulated a methodology for surveying uh, the collecting units that split out this challenge into the general collections. You've heard this, the 139 million items, and the archival collections. 137,000 cubic feet, and it asked two sets of questions. One set of questions was related to how well are we doing in terms of describing these collections with electronic records? And the second set of questions was how well are we doing in creating digital surrogates for these collections, digital images, digital audio, digital video? And I'll introduce you to some of the results from this. We've got a lot more numbers than the ones I'm throwing up, but these are sort of the core results. In terms of digital records, electronic records, uh, what we know now is that 72% of our collections do not have an electronic record. They have paper records only. Um, so we control them through paper records. 28% of the collections do have electronic records that are at a standard level, at a level where we think they're adequate. So this is a fairly substantial challenge. The units estimate that we need about 17 million additional uh, electronic records in our collections management systems in order to meet that <coughs> challenge. Now, the second one is the one that probably most people think about when they think about digitization, and that's the digital circuits, uh, images, audio, video. And here the story is slightly more complicated because we actually gave the units the opportunity to say, look, there are certain parts of our collection we're just going to, for now, for this moment in time, take off the table. We don't have ambitions right at this moment to digitize those. And that actually is the bulk of our collection. It's 90% of the collections. The reason for that is that 127 million of those 139 million items are in our natural history collections. And uh, at natural history, people said it doesn't make sense for us to digitize every single last insect and every single last uh, collection item that we hold. And that seems like a reasonable position to have at this moment in time. That leaves us with about 10% of the collection we do want to create digital surrogates for, 9% we don't have anything for yet, 1% has been digitized. So that is the ambition to uh, create digital surrogates for about 14 million items, which translates into about 13 million digital surrogates according to the data the units provided. So in summary, the overall challenge, now also folding in the data that the archives provided us with, is to create about 17 million electronic records and 25 million digital images. That's sort of the contours right now um, of the challenge as we can describe it. Now, you all probably have heard that there was a big storm on the East Coast uh, last week, and so uh, the federal government was actually closed, so I had two days at home and I thought, oh, I'll take two hours to just noodle around with a spreadsheet to figure out how much this might cost, just some very preliminary es estimates. <coughs> and the number I came up with was, and again, it's not, a, it's not a number I want to see widely cited, and I don't have it on the slide for that reason, because it's a back-of-the-napkin sort of number. It's $2 billion. That's what this would cost if we sort of used current techniques in order to do this. So that's a number with nine zeros behind it. It's a very large number. Um, to put it in perspective, the presidential campaign that just ended, they spent $6 billion on running that campaign. So if we had a little less attack ads, we actually could have the Smithsonian digitized. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just me personally. So that's the, the big picture. Now we need to figure out, so how can, how, how can we 
uh, now also understand how the units want to organize themselves around that challenge. And for that, we've created um, templates for what we call unit digitization plans. They're actually mandated by a Smithsonian policy, which you can also find online. It's available to uh, do a search for SD610 digitization and digital asset management, and you'll find it. And these unit digitization plans, in essence, define each one of our museum's digitization program. They help us understand how do the units want to attack this challenge, what are their ambitions and priorities, and we'll also let them talk about and really outline how far the current investment we're making in digitization allows them to go and what, they, what we need to invest in order to take digitization to the next level. Um, and that's important because I think we need to be very clear about what we can achieve with what we have in hand and sort of what we actually need to fundraise for in order to uh, make progress with these large numbers that we're facing. Now the thing I want to focus a little bit more with you on is this idea of ambitions and priorities uh, because the story we're at right now is still a rather large story. It's the one that I've told you up to this point. We're now trying to segment that down even further because it's very hard to get anybody to give you two billion dollars so you can you know deal with your challenge you gotta break that down into smaller chunks in order to uh, be able to attract funding and one of the ways we're doing that is through the data that will come in through this unit digitization plans so i'll now walk you through how we hope to uh, further constrain that challenge and further have a have an even more granular story about all of this. So this is a pie chart of the same data that you've seen earlier about digital surrogates. <coughs> you're, you're familiar with this now, no current emission, 90%, not done 9%, done 1% for digital surrogates. Uh, we now want to see whether we can uh, divvy up those 9% a little bit more by talking about prioritization for those 9%. And we're going to ask the units to tell us, among those 9%, what's prioritized, what's not prioritized. And then going even one level deeper, uh, we want to know uh, which projects can we execute on that would actually make progress on these prioritized collections. So what that does is it gives us three stories that we can whip out and tell uh, depending on what context we're operating in. So the digitization assessment these, this really big story that I started out with, that's really our long-term story. Let's face it, that's not going to happen overnight. Uh, the digitization priorities will carve, out, um, will carve out a space that I think we can tell, uh, talk about sort of as a midterm story, as the kind of stuff that's still probably uh, way too large to execute on you know, in, a, in a given fiscal uh, year, but that is a little bit more manageable. And then the projects are sort of the short-term story. Those are things that you could um, find funding for and that you could execute on. That's the sort of shovel-ready stuff. So we'll see how that'll play out. We don't have the data for this stuff in hand yet, but we'll have it at the beginning of the next year. And now I'll get to the much more wifty part of the presentation. I told you, you know, how do we get there? That's the stuff we're actually grappling with right now. So, so far we've got, we've got some data points in place. But now we need to figure out how can we actually organize ourselves as the entirety of the Smithsonian around this. Uh, we have at the Smithsonian an Office of Policy and Analysis where they employ incredibly smart people that are PhDs in things in fields like ec economics. Um, and we've asked them to do a study for us to help us with scenarios for operational models that help us understand how, can, how we can reach the benefits of scale for, si for such a large challenge. We'll also ask them to help us with uh, establishing cost models. What kind of factors do need to go into costing out a digitization challenge? Because we need to do better than my back of the napkin doodling. And how can we effectively forecast costs? If we want to ask somebody for money, we need to be able to uh, forecast what um, it'll actually cost. So, but one thing in all of this has already become abundantly clear to me, and I'm starting a story that probably Rebecca will continue. This is uh, about Nat the Natural History Museum. I was wandering around the collections one day with the chief of collections and the associate directors, and we started pulling out drawers 
um, in the museum and looking at collection objects. And then very playfully, we started classifying them. Uh, we said, well, you know, there's a whole bunch of bugs on pins. We actually have 35 million of those. <laughs> stuff in support cases, stuff in liquid jars, glass slides, skeletons in a box was a big one. Apparently, we have a lot of those too. <laughs> and while it was playful, the reason to do that was that these could become the foundation of digitization streams, material types that could undergo uh, a, the same process, and if we could figure out what that process is and make it really effective, that we could uh, knock out <coughs> large parts of the collection using that kind of digitization stream. So the idea was, can we define requirements for these digitization streams? Can we specify at a very precise level what the requirement would be for hardware and software and, and uh, workflows that could attack a challenge like bugs on pins? If we can do that, if we can articulate requirements, then we could promote them, promote them to the industry, to research universities, and so on and so forth. Then we could basically crowdsource this problem in a quite sophisticated way, I think, and get input from uh, folks outside of the Smithsonian who uh, can tackle that challenge. And I think one of the formats that I would like to explore in order to do that is basically a prize. Um, you're probably familiar with, um, there's a number of organizations that sponsor prizes that have challenges uh, that have a purse attached to them. Um, one of them is the X Prize Foundation. Um, that's probably the most prominent one. And I got this idea from a, um, an online publication from McKinsey and Company that's called And the Winner Is. Um, it was published in 2009 and it basically lays out how you can incentivize innovation through prizes. Um, and prizes are really a great way in order to mobilize uh, smart people from outside of your direct sphere of influence in order to engage on a challenge, um, attract that kind of talent, create really innovative approaches that you yourself would have likely never thought of, um, and then do that in a very high profile way, in a way that actually also then sort of creates, as um, some folks call it, a photo finish for a, for a competition where people actually want to be the winner of that purse. And all of that, A, provides solutions, but B, also is a, a big um, marketing win, so to speak. Um, it's a way we can talk about our challenge, and it's a way we can show people how we really try to solve that challenge in a, in a very, very big way. So you're getting the impression that I'm obsessed with scale, and I am, but I'm also obsessed with, with quality. Um, and this, I know screen resolution is not really a stand-in for image quality, but let me riff on this for a moment because it's something I'm concerned about. Uh, this is some data about the resolution of displays. Um, in 2003, most people looked at um, stuff at an, on an SVGA display. In 2008, most people had migrated up to XGA. Today, 85% of folks are looking at uh, stuff on a display that's higher resolution than XGA. And then put that together with, um, uh, with Apple launching the Retina display, which is close to 3,000 pixels on the longest dimension. And I think you're sort of really closing in on uh, a kind of file size that our community not so long ago considered to be a master file size. So what, I, what I'm trying to get at is that images we thought of as high resolution three, four, five, six years ago now will barely fill a single screen. And I think that is going to be a challenge for us. Um, there's some experimental research that I found very exciting. Uh, this was published in Nature in June 20th of 2012, where Duke and DARPA uh, announced that they had created with sort of off-the-shelf components a camera that at a single shot can create a gigapixel of data. So that's a lot of data. And uh, they said that they would, as a follow-on project, work on a 50 gigapixel uh, camera. It's right now black and white, but again, this is experimental and it's, um, it's uh, in development. But I think it points the way that we might see um, in conjunction with the sort of rise of screen resolution, also new technologies that, can, that might allow us to 
uh, keep up with that. There's two products in the marketplace that I've seen that are that I find interesting that uh, would allow us already right now to create gigapixel images. Uh, you may have seen the Jixel folks. They were actually here at the 2011 MCN in the vendor hall. Uh, they have a robotic capture system that captures uh, basically wall hanging art. And uh, not only does it uh, create gigapixel images, it also does it very, very fast. They claim that they can do entire galleries in a, you know, in a matter of uh, a week or so. Uh, we've got a test coming up at the Smithsonian that was co-organized by the Museum Conservation Institute and the National Portrait Gallery, and we'll put that system through its paces and see what the applications at the Smithsonian might be. Um, similar um, idea is the Giga, Giga Macro system, which is now a system that's shooting down in a sort of more traditional photography stand setup, and again, like uh, the Jigsaw system it deploys image stitching, stitches massive amounts of images together in, in order to create ultra high resolution images. And it also does focal point stacking in order to do that. So you have uh, an image that's sharp wherever you look. Um, the data from that system could also be post-processed into 3D models. So this is, this is very interesting and I think bears investigation to how that could be applied. Um, at the Smithsonian, and I, Rebecca shared with me earlier that uh, Natural History is looking into purchasing one of those machines for their imaging lab and uh, seeing how they can, they can deploy it. And that's about all I've got for you, and I will hand it over to Rebecca to tell you about what this challenge looks like from the perspective of a single unit, Natural History. mentioned I'm going to be talking more from a single museum's perspective um, versus the entire Smithsonian um, and kind of talk about the practicalities of trying to achieve these lofty aims. Um, so we're going to talk about natural history's journey from the wild west of digitization uh, to where we are today. Um, so just to give you a little bit of context and not to go over too much what we've already talked about. Um, just so you have an idea of where I'm coming from, from natural history, and you can kind of scale it down appropriately to your unit. Um, what is natural history? Um, we have two physical buildings, our very large museum on the actual mall in DC. We also have a very large um, storage facility in Maryland that holds our holding, has all of our holdings. Um, we have seven uh, unique research and collections departments. We have a very large education and outreach facility that has um, teaching collections and going to be opening up a teaching center very soon. Um, we also have the National Anthropological Archives, which has a rather tremendous holding as well, um, about a million images, and they also have video, et cetera. Um, and we also have several on-site affiliate organizations, which are other government agencies that per permanently reside um, inside our museum, and they have their own collections housed with us and also um, their own collections. So it's, it's a lot of things. So how much do we have? As Gunther mentioned, we are guessing we have about 127 million specimens. It's a decent guess, but we won't know until we're done. <laughs> I mean, we spent, how many years was the, the collections assessment? We did it in the 70s. It was mandated by Congress because we have absolutely no idea. Now we have a general idea, and it took several years of uh, hundreds of people going through our collections and finding out. Um, but you have this giant number in front of you. You don't know really what it looks like. Um, at Natural History, this is what 127 million looks like, um, or a small row from each department uh, of their collections. And as you can see, we have a tremendous diversity of objects reaching from every possible field of science that you can think of. And if you can think of what it is, we have it. Um, you know, we have. Uh, things in uh, jars, as Gunter mentioned. We have a tremendous number of insects, um, skins, things on paper. You know, it's, and the size diversity is pretty amazing, like seeds and whale skulls. Um, so you have all these collections. You need to kind of organize them and, you know, keep track of them and be able to find them when you need to. And so 
Uh, being an older museum, we of course started off with paper catalog cards, um, and that worked fine for a while until we got, uh, you know, with the beginning of the digital era, we started to really seize on the early computer activity. So back in 1963, we actually helped develop Seljum, which is one of the first mainframe systems to keep track of catalog data. So we've been digitizing our specimens for quite a while. Um, when digital photography first started coming in in the 70s and the early 80s, we took to it like wildfire. And what happened is we kind of ended up with this Wild West scenario where everyone's running around and competing for funds and, uh, you know, just, you know, funders are wildly shooting into the air like, I've got money for you and you and you and, you know, <laughs> it's, it was just incredible. And, you know, there weren't standards at the time. There was no way of keeping track of it all. We had no idea. And, um, you know, the best way to get funding was to have the most photogenic and shiny horse, and you would get, you know, funding because it looked good on paper and it sounded good. So we had the same collections kind of digitized over and over and over again because everyone loves a jade beetle. Um, but, you know, the less photogenic algae collections <laughs> had a hard time. <laughs> and <laughs> so uh, what we started to do, um, yeah, so what you ended up with is in the beginning, um, we had lots of small individual projects, um, and it was pretty manageable on the man when you look at it just as the project. It had a project manager, they understood what they were doing, you know, they had their small staff, they had their results, they kept them to themselves, and it worked out fine. But when we really started to ask questions about um, what do we have, how much have we done already, did we do this already, we don't know, um, and we kind of started to realize that it's just total chaos. Um, I mean, you just can't possibly keep track of it all. You don't know what you have. Um, so what we started to do was um, starting really in earnest in the two, early 2000s, natural history started to organize itself, kind of create a few policies. We had some priorities for um, you know, assessing the priority of a collection for their digitization. Um, Try to get kind of the early stages of what Gunther's group was talking about. Um, and then when they started to ramp up in about 2008, it really worked well and kind of dovetailed with our efforts. So we were lucky. We were a little bit ahead of the game compared to some of the other units. Um, and back last year, basically, we created, um, we wanted to establish some law and order, so to speak. Um, so we kind of brought in the new sheriff in town. Um, we have the digitization steering committee, which we call Digicom for short, because we like acronyms. Um, so what is the D Digicom? This is kind of our practical application of trying to achieve di logical and progressive um, digitization. Um, so we're trying to bring structure and order to the chaos. And we really just want this to be our committee, to be a centralized place for people within our museum to go to so that they can find easily um, best practices, some guidelines for digitization. Um, you know, I don't expect every curator to know all the Smithsonian apply, uh, policies that apply to them. They may not know them. Um, so we have them all in a single place. This is a screenshot of our intranet um, site that's also available to anyone within the Smithsonian. Um, and it just has, you know, forms, documents, policies, um, our charter for the groups so that they know what we're, um, we're kind of accomplish. Um, so, when we created this, it kind of has, we really wanted this to be everything to everyone. And so when you do that, you really have to think very carefully about, uh, you know, how do you want to accomplish this and who's going to be involved? Um, because if you get the wrong people involved or not the right people involved, it's, it's not going to be as productive as you want. So the first thing that we decided was that we wanted it to be as inclusive as you possibly can make it. Um, we have, as you saw, we have a very large, diverse set of collections. So what we did uh, for us is we made sure that we had representation from all the primary units that involve collections and digitization. So we also did something unique where we have two chairs. We have one person who's from the IT side of the fence and another person who's the head of collections for the museum. Um, this way we have kind of a broad strategic look at how we're accomplishing digitization from both sides. Um, we also have somebody from each of the research departments to make sure that all the kind of quirky elements of their types of specimens are considered and taken into account. Um, we have somebody from the Education Outreach Center because of their teaching collections. 
Um, we have somebody from exhibits because they generate a tremendous amount of content for exhibits and videos. Um, and we didn't want to forget about that just because they're not proper session collections. We also have somebody from our affiliate organizations because they do so much digitization of our own materials that we wanted to make sure that they were involved. And we also have some from the libraries. And just because we're so enormous, we have another layer of bureaucracy, of course. Um, we have somebody that's our official sponsor who's at the top level of our museum. Um, they're not involved in the day-to-day -day operations, but they provide kind of a strategic outlook and they kind of act as the enforcer if we have an issue or we need compliance on something. Um, it's a lot easier to get uh, people to agree to things when, you know, the head of science for the museum is emailing you directly. Um, and we also have something called a vice chair, which is the person, uh, because everyone involved is so busy, we have one person who takes real ownership of the committee that makes sure that everything stays on track and that we're not losing sight of some of the bigger issues as we rush through you know, annual deadlines and things like that. That's my job, so it's fun. So, uh, like I said, we wanna be everything to everyone, so we're trying to be the voice of natural history as we look outward. Um, when we have discussions with the castle, which is what we call our central admin, um, we represent natural history. It's not just one department's interests. Um, so we can kind of push, because as you noticed, the numbers were very large. Um, so we want to make sure that we get fair proportional representation. Um, also, when we're dealing with the central IT to kind of get resources for like, um, you know, we need more terabytes than some of the smaller museums do. Um, and also when we're dealing with um, Gunther's office. Uh, but we also want to look the other way. We want to look towards all the individual departments to make sure that everyone's needs are met and has a voice in how uh, natural history moves forward, which has been uh, a challenge up until this point. Um, so how do we accomplish this? We have all the big ideas. Um, so the first step was to organize ourselves, and that basically involves meetings, meetings, and more meetings. Um, we had to sit down and really review the existing priorities that natural history had and see if we still felt that they aligned with our overall needs and did they match up with the um, Smithsonian priorities. Um, you know, for once, we really started to think about strategically awarding funding, um, not just these haphazard moments or kind of scraping together money from here and here and here. We really tried to be um, the central place where the final approval happens for certain funding. Um, that has been extremely helpful because that really forces people to comply with the policies and the standards. Like, if you don't, you know, provide the metadata or you don't put it into the central system, you don't get funding. Um, so that's worked really well for us. Um, the other thing we've done is we took uh, ownership of all the natural history policies that involve digitization in any way. Um, and now it's our job to review them and um, revise them as they need and as the deadlines come up, because we have a lot of you know, five-year strategic plans, uh, things like that. Um, and just basically, it, the buck stops with us. You know, we're the accountable parties, and there's just, it's an easier way of dealing with things. Now, with all of this, we had to be really careful to not swing the pendulum totally in the opposite direction, where you go from total chaos to complete bureaucracy. Um, and we're really trying to maintain kind of a, a middle ground somewhere in there, maybe a little more towards the organization side than chaos. Um, so how do we do that? Like, how do we maintain our nimbleness so that we can actually, because what we're doing right now is, you know, it's worked fine for the last 39 years of digitization that we've done, but it's not fast enough, and there's no way we're going to hit the additional 17 million records, or 15 of which are from natural history, um, in the time frame. That's a reasonable time frame. We'd need another, you know, 40 or 50 years to accomplish that. Um, so to be a little bit more flexible, we're trying to be um, more active. Um, and so what we've done is we've uh, kind of collected from all the previous digitization efforts that are within a reasonable time frame. Um, kind of create case studies from those kind of lessons learned um, where we are the sponsor of a, um, a project, we'll actually generate that as well. Um, 
so that we can kind of do a one-stop lessons learned so that everyone doesn't have to learn the same lesson over and over and over again that like you know voice recognition does not work with taxonomic names how many times do we have to <laughs> learn that lesson <laughs> apparently a lot um, so one of the things we've done this past year is we've supported um, several pilot projects uh, that test out new methodologies and technologies to kind of see um, how they work how they might be applied is there better departments and others for that to work um, are we interested in pursuing this? And we fully expect at least half of them to not work out. So it's okay to fail, which is a hard thing in the government to say. Um, and we also are trying to be, as a single voice, we're trying to be a little bit more involved on the SI large scale planning uh, for these bigger digitization efforts. And when they're purchasing you know, equipment, we'd like to have a say to make sure that our collections are represented and can be used by whatever large purchases are happening. Um, it also puts into this position to be able to coordinate uh, more external partnerships with other museums that are doing kind of cool new things. Um, it's harder for a single department to approach, they don't really have the authority to approach these other, um, like the Australian uh, Museum of Art or something to work on a collaborative project, but natural history can. Um, and that's worked really well. And like Gunther mentioned, one of the things we're also doing is not thinking in digitization in terms of departmental silos. We're also looking at it um, by types. So we have you know, the stuff in jars, the stuff on paper. In that box, you can decide if there's a cat or a skeleton in there. Um, we have the drawers and the things on pins. Um, so the little digitization rapid pilots that we are doing, um, right now they're focusing on types, and, uh, and types not in the taxonomic sense. Um, so the stuff in drawers, um, our Gigapan uh, rapid pilot was working, um, focusing on trying to digitize things on the drawer level. Um, the tests that we're doing with Giga Macro also involve digitizing entire drawers at once. Um, and also uh, our mobile device capturing data via mobile device while people are in the collections um, was also, is also progressing. The stuff on pins um, is also Gigapan because those are stuff on pins in drawers. Um, so it's kind of a, a double one. Um, and we're also looking at Giga Macro to try to see if we can kind of automate that process and make it rapid so that you just put one standard size drawer on the um, system and then put another one, put another one, put another one, and then you can go in and use a macro and divide it out by the little box size that's in there. Um, and then we also have the stuff on paper, rapid pilots. And these are more focused on the little labels that are nested in the box with the specimens and the handwritten catalog cards that people find when they're going to the, the collections for other reasons than digitization. They can pull out their phone or their tablet device and take a picture and upload it to our system automatically so that they can kind of digitize as they go along if necessary. Um, the voice recognition, we learned it again. Hopefully this is the last time. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, just so a side note, voice recognition does fantastic with numbers and that's it. Um, so that's where we were coming from, where we're moving towards and kind of where we are now um, after one year of um, this uh, committee being involved. Um, we have about six million catalog records available um, almost all of which are available online as well. Um, and you can see a nice um, jump in the last few years. Um, and these are, the chart only goes back to 2007 just because that's when we started putting things online. Um, we also have um, over a million of the objects we have images for in our collections management system. This isn't even counting all the stuff that we have uh, in other systems. And we also have gone through and geo-referenced a sizable chunk of our um, objects, which is more than just, you know, I have a city-state location. This is actual the geo-ref coordinates. Uh, so that's where we are, and we still have a long way to go, but <laughs> we're getting there. So. Now you can talk about the fun stuff. <laughs> I don't know how to start yours. Just a moment, I think. Oh. 
All right. So I'm a 3D digitization coordinator at the Smithsonian, one of two, um, and that means that I get to try to uh, help define the role of what 3D documentation technologies mean and how they could be used at the Smithsonian. So I get um, to work with a lot of interesting folks, uh, scientists, curators, uh, conservators, exhibits developers, you name it. Uh, that also means that um, I am guilty of random acts of digitization. Um, <laughs> but this is sort of a necessary evil right now. We hope that we can take sort of the uh, almost case study-like projects that we're working on now and um, industrialize the process in the future. So what is 3D digitization? Uh, basically, you can think of this as measurement in its simplest terms. It, instead of taking point-to-point -point measurement that we'd be accustomed to with a pair of calipers or ruler, we're taking thousands, millions, or billions of measurements, and these can describe really complicated surfaces of an object. So a couple of generic examples. We have uh, in green on the left a Camptosaurus uh, fossil. That's the original geometry that's been crushed uh, over millions of years in the rock. Um, and we can sort of objectively bring that back into symmetry using 3D software tools. In this case, the software is called Landmark. And then we can do something called deviation analysis. So we can sort of holistically compare two different sets of geometry. So what does the data look like? Um, this is the Olmec, an Olmec head um, behind the Natural History Museum. Um, and this is sort of a simplified pipeline for uh, uh, working with 3D data and processing it. You start with what we call a point cloud, which is, again, those thousands, millions, or billions of XYZ coordinates. Um, the great thing about this is it's fairly simple data. Again, XYZ coordinates. We can open up uh, files in an Excel spreadsheet and actually do a fair amount of manipulation right there. So even though files can get big and cumbersome, at least they can stay fairly simple in the raw data state. From there, things can get a little bit more proprietary with uh, uh, file formats with the polygon model phase. We've essentially connected the dots. Uh, digital light can reflect off of the surface of your model, and you can now uh, output the model in something like a 3D printer or carve it out with a CNC router, things like that. And then, of course, we can take photographs and we can map color back onto the object if we need to. So we've promised bugs. Here's another. So this is micro CT data. Um, and this is a, a great way to document small objects. This is one of the highest resolution methods of 3D documentation possible. Um, some micro CT scanners can uh, nearly reach the uh, molecular geometry of an object, so you're measuring in uh, nanometers, microns. You also get interior geometry of an object, which is not the case for uh, most scanning processes. <coughs> you also get density information for each of those XYZ coordinates. So along with that stunning resolution and accuracy comes very high cost. Uh, we don't yet have a micro CT scanner at the Smithsonian, so we have to contract that out. Um, but hopefully in the long run, we'll be able to secure that kind of equipment. So the reason we were scanning that particular insect is that a unit at the Smithsonian called Smithsonian Gardens asked us to create anatomical models of some rare orchids. Um, so these were good candidates for us to begin working with micro CT really complicated geometry, both uh, on the outside of the flower and the interior. Uh, but we had a few things to learn uh, working with these tools uh, with this particular subject matter. Uh, the flower tended to wilt while it was in the machine, while it was being scanned. So we got some okay results at, at first, but we're going to have to try this a few more times and figure out a pipeline to actually document uh, flowers in particular. Uh, we're thinking that freeze drying could be a solution in this instance that'll keep the flower nice and rigid while it's in the machine. And it should preserve the shape of the flower as well. So, um, you know, it's, it's not quite like throwing an object in a toaster um, or a microwave and pressing the button. Um, so it does take a, far, a fair amount of user expertise as well when you're talking about digitizing a variety of different materials. Um, so again, if we can get to the point where we sort of nail how to scan a flower, how to scan a bug, um, how to scan a box of bones, then we can move on to industrializing the process. 
A similar project was uh, uh, with the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. They wanted anatomical models of blue crabs uh, to use as a teaching tool. And um, they were going to have us scan uh, some sculptures of crabs. And we said we could go directly to the source here. And so we boldly went into the field to collect specimens. <laughs> And again, you know, this is sort of where it's at. This is what we're aiming for in terms of uh, resolution and accuracy. Uh, but it's definitely a difficult game to play given the cost and expertise necessary uh, to work with this type of data. Uh, next, we'll talk about a project with the Freer Sackler Gallery. So they specialize in Asian art. Uh, we're looking at a 1,400-year-old Buddha figure here carved out of stone. Um, and on that figure, you have uh, low relief carving over the entire surface. So you basically have a two-dimensional uh, narrative sort of wrapped around a very three-dimensional object. So it's a particularly difficult object to engage with. There's a whole lot of information being thrown at you all at once. Um, and although it's quite stunning and beautiful, it's definitely sort of hard to understand what's going on. Um, so this tells the story of enlightenment, so there are terrible depictions of things happening in hell at the bottom. There's enlightenment at the top and earth somewhere in between. And traditional methods of documentation would be a charcoal rubbing. And so contact methods of documenting an object like this are increasingly taboo, of course. Um, but this also tends to fraction, fracture the narrative that's, that's happening that sort of wraps around uh, the model unexpectedly. So for this object, we're using a articulated laser arm scanner to document. Um, this is a great tool for objects of this size on down to something maybe the size of a baseball. Um, the way it works is a laser beam bounces off the object back into a sensor. The time it takes to do that can be equated to a very precise measurement. And then the laser is actually attached to the articulated arm, which can track where the laser is in space very precisely. We complemented the laser scan data with photogrammetry data as well. Um, so photogrammetry, for those that aren't familiar, basically is a way to take two-dimensional images and get accurate three-dimensional data from those photographs. So took a handful of photographs of the sockets for the missing hands and head. The uh, laser scanner actually couldn't reach inside those um, small uh, areas, so we had to resort to photogrammetry and then combine the two data sets. Uh, the purple boxes are the camera positions, and the yellow dots is a sparse point cloud. That's sort of the initial geometry that is developed before we do the high resolution geometry. And so on the left, you have photogrammetry data. On the right, you have the laser scan data. You get pretty good color information in general with photogrammetry, so that's one of the benefits. Uh, you have lower accuracy. And more important um, than the fact that you have lower accuracy in general is that you have uh, unknown accuracy much of the time. So you could have areas of very high accuracy next to areas of low accuracy, and you don't have a great way of parsing out which, which is which. Here are the data sets combined. So the next step was to hand over some draft renderings to the curator, and he's able to sort of label all the figures and try to figure out what's happening in the different uh, storylines. Here's another draft rendering. So on the left-hand side, we have a photograph. On the right-hand side, we have a rendering of the 3D model in 3D Studio Max. So we applied a method called uh, cavity, what's it called? Cavity map mapping, I believe. So this exaggerates the areas of high curvature in the model. And so you sort of get a more diagrammatic experience. And we'll be able to render this out in maybe a half dozen different ways that should help to highlight different types of features on the model. And then the next step is going to be something that's typically reserved for uh, video game industry or uh, movie making. You can actually, when you want to um, add color information to a model, you flatten it back out into the 2D world. So we're going to be able to do that. And just like you want to flatten a globe out into a flat surface uh, to navigate, let's say, Google Maps, this will be a much more uh, convenient way to interact and study the object. And then once the curator's done uh, with his research, this will be a great public access tool. So again, we'll have a sort of Google Maps style experience where anybody can navigate the model. 3D models are also very cumbersome online right now. So whenever we can flatten it out and have this sort of uh, gigapixel style experience, we 
we tend to aim for that. The next project was a collaboration with the Hirshhorn uh, Museum and Sculpture Garden. So we're looking at a plaster sculpture here. It's a wall hanging piece and it has a light bulb in the back that needs changing regularly. It's a very delicate object um, and the conservators were interested in a way to interact with it more safely. So we used a laser arm scanner to document it and here we're actually interested in the negative space so we can reverse the geometry and then make a cradle that can capture the object very precisely and distribute the pressure on the object very evenly. So here's a quick rendering of the negative space. And for this, we're using software called 123D Make. Uh, a lot of folks have probably heard of 123D Catch, which is free photogrammetry software. Um, this is free software to take those uh, 3D models and then get those back into the real world. And what it does is it parses out the geometry into two-dimensional slices. And then you can export those slices to a CNC laser cutter or a CNC router or a water jet cutter. And here you can cut out of uh, wood, metal. In this case, we're using cardboard. So the important thing about this is that originally for this project, we had imagined using 3D printing technologies to make the cradle. And that was very possible. It probably would have worked just fine, but it would have been very, very expensive with most 3D printing uh, materials. So by doing it this way and using cardboard, we took the cost from thousands of dollars down to hundreds of dollars. So now this is more than just sort of a case study that says this can be done in more of a useful um, uh, pipeline for us to apply to other projects and other um, objects in the different museums. So it's fairly simple assembly. We're able to make a dummy object so we can interact with that before we start handling the real piece. And again, we're working with cardboard here, so it's fairly cost effective. And this is what we hope will be the final draft. We know we'll have to make at least one more of these before uh, we have something that we'll actually uh, engage with the object with. So um, this next project was a collaboration with National Geographic in the Chilean National Museum. In Chile, they were expanding the Pan American Highway and they bumped into about 40 whale fossils. Oops. So they did an excavation um, properly, um, but expedited. So things were done much more quickly than the researchers would have hoped. Um, the documentation for the majority of the site is this, which is a you know, traditional method. Uh, you have one meter grids and simple outlines of where the fossils lay in space. And the whales are preserved and jacketed. Uh, they're currently in the museum, but of course they don't have a lot of resources for 40 unexpected um, fossilized whales, and it could be five, 10 years before they actually are able to prepare these and make them available for research again. So um, the, they still exist, but they're inaccessible at this point. So we were called in to document eight of the best preserved specimens while they were still in the ground. Um, we're looking at another tool here. This is a medium range laser scanner. And this is good for documenting uh, much larger objects. So you can uh, scan entire rooms, buildings, chunks of landscapes, um, and archaeological sites like this. It's good for a range of probably uh, effectively one meter away to 50 meters away, depending on the accuracy and resolution that you need. We also used our articulated laser arm scanner. Um, funny story here is that we ordered the tripod to work in the field um, and it arrived a couple days before we got on the plane. We mounted it on the tripod and realized we could no longer reach the ground with the scanner. Um, so we had to build this crude car uh, plywood box in the field, fill it with concrete, and it worked beautifully. Um, it worked just fine because of the weight, but now we had a 400 pound box that we had to haul in 20 different positions around an eight meter long whale. Um, so we don't hope to do an object this big with this scanner. Um, anytime soon again. But it worked. And we complemented the laser scan data with photogrammetry data. Um, and so again, one of the major reasons is that we get good color information that we can complement the laser scan data with. But we were really surprised um, and happy about the results that we did get with photogrammetry data. So we're looking at uh, the white boxes here, our camera positions, the geometry of the object in the middle. It seems like every six months or so, there's a new photogrammetric software solution. So you can take the same photographs that you 
um, had for se previous projects and get exponentially better results um, with that same data set. So we've taken photographs and created photogrammetry data sets where we knew that we couldn't process them in their current state with current software. And lo and behold, you wait a year or two, and then you can actually engage with that data set. So we're looking at another couple of renderings from the photogrammetry data here. These are not photographs. On the left-hand side, we have an orthogonally correct um, color uh, image. And so you can measure in the x and y coordinates. On the right-hand side, you have a grayscale representation of um, the whales. And this means that we have measurable x, y, and z dimensions in images. So again, this is a great way to take incredibly cumbersome um, large data sets and turn them into a uh, file format that researchers and the public alike can engage with fairly simply. So this is sort of a prototype for a viewer. Um, nothing particularly special, but you can pull those measurements. And again, the, the great thing is that we can use HTML5 and have a measurable data set that leaves very little behind from the original high resolution uh, 3D data in its raw state. So one cool little feature that um, uh, our volunteer that developed this software cooked up is that as you pull the measurement, you can see the Z height profile. So there's a green line along the bottom that appears as you pull the measurement. Again, with photogrammetry, um, uh, it's usually a fairly simple processing uh, pipeline. With laser scan data, it'll be months before we have all of our data sets sort of uh, processed and viewable. Uh, with photogrammetry, a lot of the software out there is push button. So within a week of having returned from the field, we had printable 3D models. Um, and so that was a nice quick turnaround there. So on a similar note, the curator that uh, we were working with, Dr. Nicholas Pyanson, he was able to blog while we were doing the documentation. He did a lot of uh, phone interviews. We got a lot of press and publicity. And so this was a cool thing about uh, this project and something that we hope to sort of um, uh, engage with more in the future is turning around content very quickly. So with the, not only do we have uh, high-end forms of documentation here, we can actually turn that content around in days and, or hours and days rather than months and years. And that's something that we hope to reinforce in future projects. And with that, I'm all set. Thank you. Um, I want to thank all the speakers for staying on time. That was great. <laughs> um, just to, before I turn it over for questions, one thing that strikes me here is to build on Rebecca's wild west metaphor. Um, what seemed, I don't know if this is working anyway. Okay. Uh, what seems to be going on here is you're taking, uh, you're corralling a lot of things. So you're trying to tame the Wild West. You're trying to show your thoroughbred horses. Um, but you're also exploring innovative and new methods of doing things in the hopes and knowledge that, well, with the knowledge that some will fail, but with the hopes that those that do succeed can be, as Adam said, industrialized, kind of make into a workflow that's productive, production ready, and therefore help increase the pace of digitization here. So um, I'll turn it over now to you for questions. We have about 20 minutes, so plenty of time. Anybody? Simon, I'm going to start with you. other museum strategies such as your audience development strategies and things like that and how those things were intersecting with each other to inform each other. I'll, let, I'll actually let you take that again because oh. you were around when the strategy was written and I was not. <laughs> Which strategy? <laughs> um, the, strate the digitization strategic plan you mean? Um, at that time there was kind of a division of labor sense uh, at the Smithsonian, there was a sense that we needed to um, just have the digital assets available. I mean, you can't really serve them up if they're not there. So there was a sense that you needed to increase the availability of high quality digital assets, first of all. And you had to do so in a way that was more representative than currently existed. So that when people wanted to search for something, they could get a, a good uh, hit return rate of results. Um, 
so that was kind of divvied up at the time into what was called the Digitization Strategic Plan, which right now seems a little odd because it totally excludes web and new media strategies and audience development. However, the other side of that was they then created an arm uh, of individuals, a group of individuals who developed that strategy, and you know Mike Edson was the leader of that. Um, what I think the challenge is now is getting the two back together in a way that's more integrated. But I think at the time it made sense. This was a couple years ago. And given where the Smithsonian was with its random acts of digitization, and those random acts included random acts of new media and web strategies. I mean, there were different websites. Nobody knew who was developing what. And um, But now I think there's two good plans. And the next logical step from my outside perspective would be to start bringing those together. Does that answer your question? No. <laughs> I can't rephrase it in the way that makes no sense. I was, I was, it's just the, my experience is this, 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 this seems to be in the number of museums, not necessarily controlled by those, it's not asking the question, that there's this disconnect between digital, which is it's going to be good for everyone, mm -hmm. just an assumption that everyone is already in. Right. And then you look at the Right. 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 And whether the digital is being targeted to also do those same things in the same ways, or is it, it just seems to be a very blank. It it can just be good. Mm -hmm. All of these people. I'm just wondering how that was working for you. That was all. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I personally think there's a myth if we digitize for everybody. Um, you can try to do that. Good luck. <laughs> um, I think you're more online with the strategy that you digitize for certain audiences at certain times. And so what you try to do is level it out as much as you can so others can reuse your assets for different audiences at different times. Um, but that's, that's the hard line to get. It is. And we, it was a very inclusive process. I, Museums throughout the entire Smithsonian were involved in a numerous uh, quantity of committees and panels that were dealing with different sections, and so there were a lot of there was a lot of input from all the different units and the different perspectives that went into creating the final digitization strategic plan. Um, natural history, when we were creating our strategic plan, it taps into that, but it also we're focusing on a slightly different audience than some of the other. Um, in the museums are like we're much more focused towards researchers. You know, we also want to engage the public, but we also want to make sure that our primary users, who are the research community, who uh, con come to us either online or in person, are their needs are being met as well, and they're not always perfectly aligned with those visions. And that is that is, has been a challenge. If I can bring up, we have um what's being called unit digitization plans and digital asset management plans that are being required of the various departments and units at the Smithsonian. And one of the questions in those plans, and I'm blanking on which one, <laughs> says, who is your primary audience? The DAM. The DAM, thank you. The digital asset management plan. Who is your primary audience? Because that's really what you're digitizing for. And then who are secondary and tertiary possible audiences? And you know, can you and, and will you want to meet those demands at some point in the future? But it's really focusing on the primary audiences for creating and managing those assets. Uh, question for Adam: um, Is it easy to train somebody to do the, the photogrammetry? What cameras do you use, and can you use high-resolution video as a substitute for still camera? So you can use a point-and-shoot camera, you can use an SLR. Point-and-shoots actually have uh, more depth of field, which means that more is going to be in focus. So especially with macro work, uh, that actually can be an asset. Um, we often take our SLR photographs and complement that with a geotagged point-and-shoot just to make sure that we have a backup for scale. Um, video is a little bit tricky. With really great light, um, uh, that will work, but I think that most photogrammetric software solutions are tuned to photography and not video. I think that'll come, but we're not there yet, and so it's kind of uncharted ter ter territory for me to shoot video and hope that it'll work. I can do that now with photo photography, but not necessarily video. Yeah, this gentleman. I'm sorry, and then I'll go. 
So with regards to the digitization is the first piece, then there's the preservation of digital objects. So where does, what is the strategic uh, approach for that and the rest of the units, or is it is there an overall strategy for digital preservation? Yeah, so in, at the Smithsonian, what we currently have uh, quite well fleshed out is a digital asset management system that cuts across all the units and that at this point, all the units are participating in. That doesn't mean they put all their data in that system, but everybody's put some data in. And so everybody's got workflows in place that allows them to do that. And that's been a pretty big deal that actually that work started about six years ago, if I recall correctly what my colleagues have told me about the deep, dark history of this. And uh, so we're now at a point where we can say everybody's online with that system and everybody can contribute their data. So that system covers mainly uh, photography of collections, digital photography of collections, as well as event photography. As you can surmise from uh, the talks, there's also a ton of scientific data being generated at the Smithsonian data sets, uh, measurements data from instruments, and so on and so forth. And that's a, a much bigger challenge for us, I would say. But uh, we've also now have a new office within the office of the chief information officer that is tasked with looking at preserving that data um, that's headed by Thorny Staples. And he uh, has a prototype uh, repository that looks at how can we siphon off data, research data, from the researchers while they're in the field. So not doing it sort of when they're done with their research and sort of the data is sitting fallow somewhere. But as they're doing their work, how can we support them and at the same time siphon off the data so it gets properly preserved? Um, and for both of those systems, the data itself would then live or is living uh, in the Smithsonian Data Center, which is out in Herndon, Virginia, about 45 minutes drive from downtown. And you know that has all the bells and whistles of redundancy and backup and whatnots. Um, so that's that's at the moment where that is at. So I think we're we're doing all right, uh, but we could do a lot better. And uh, Diane mentioned uh, digital asset management plans. Uh, that's another way for us to push on the idea that whenever a unit actually creates data, whether it's digitization of collections or whether it's scientific research data, they actually now need to write down what they're going to do with that data and what the long-term plan for preserving that data is and what the right situation is for that data. Um, so kind of provide a, provide a view of the circumstances within which that data was created and how we should bring it forward, or if we should bring it forward at all. And we hope that that will also then help us get a much better handle on what kind of data is out there and what data is falling through the cracks and needs to be better managed. Yes. Are you using commercial products? Do you have vendors for that? Are you building it in-house? <coughs> does everyone use like the same collections management software? Do you have different groups? Um. I, can, I can answer that. Um, <laughs> we have a a tremendous diversity of collections. So we tend to have certain units that have similar types of data have the same collections management system. Um, so the art museums use one, the science and collecting museums use another. I think we have three official ones that we're do you, using. Do you mine that and put it into one repository or in space? They're technically separate, but we do have an integration layer that we all feed um, flattened versions of our data to. We call it the Eden, which is an Apache Solar um, mass index that we do that can be searchable across everything. Um, so that's our way of kind of integrating the systems. We have a, there's a lot of data sharing that's going on within the Smithsonian and externally as well. Um, and we're trying to ramp that up. So when you aggregate that data, do you have a No, it's an Eden. I know we're yeah. submitting six million records in natural <coughs> history to Eden. I think they have. Actually, currently the count is a lot lower. I think they say they have two million records in it, and they have about seven hundred thousand digital assets uh, in the system. So it's once we're giving them six, so they have to have more than that. <laughs> <laughs> they, they might not be loaded yet. So okay. At least that's, those are the numbers from the. Those are the numbers of what's publicly available at the moment. 
and that's growing constantly. Um, when I started at the Smithsonian about two years ago, it, I think it was below a million uh, records, and now it's up at two million. So it's a it's a it's a little bit of a slog. I mean, in essence, they had to write extraction mechanisms for all the different systems. And even if you know seven of our art units share the same system, they use TMS, but they use different instances of TMS. So they had to customize the extraction mechanisms for those different systems. And then the data comes into uh, that, that uh, integration layer. And then what you can see publicly is the Smithsonian Collection Search Center. So you can go online and check that out. And that right at the homepage actually has, um, if you're online, Rebecca, you, you can fine. check. Um, that has the numbers of how much stuff is currently in there. But it's still just scratching the surface. I mean, we're trying hard, but it's scratching the surface. It's not comprehensive. So you have one sort of unified public interface now that individual museums don't have theirs separately online? We do have ours separately as online as well, for at least Natural History does. So I can look at the same records through the unified interface? Yeah. Right, and they have links to each other. Yeah. So, because the centralized one is you know, common to everybody, so it doesn't have as detailed information that we might have on our specimens. Um, so what we've done is we have, you know, we have our full records available online through through our natural history collections, and then also available and discoverable through the central system. This gentleman here. Yeah, I was kind of curious uh, about um, questions around resistance and culture change and buy-in and stuff. Yeah, did you both at the macro? Level? We refuse to comment. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we have to move slow. They have almost eight million catalog records. Ah, I was so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, we are moving slowly. I think that's the main issue. Education is a real issue, um, and part of the reason we were really careful with um, how we created. Um, the committee is that we wanted to make sure that everyone felt that they had, they were represented and they had a voice and a say in how things were going to be managed. And I didn't mention this in the presentation, but one of the things that we really focused on was who we were picking. We didn't want people who were part of the committee just because of ex officio, that this is the chair of this department and they're always involved in these decisions. We really wanted to pick people who had actually done digitization. Um, but also were able to step back from just the needs of their department um, and look at the needs of the museum as a whole. Um, and yeah, I mean, that, we spent over a month going over names over and over and over again to really f find a group of people that would really work well together. And we've done that for just over a year now, and it's gone really well. Mm. And I'd say, you know, we the Smithsonian, and I think you're getting that sense, There's it's this layer and layer of concentric s circles, if you will. So Rebecca is talking about the concentric circles within natural history where there are uh, divisions and departments, and that all wants to come together in some way. And then Penn Institutionally, it's the same, just, uh, you know, even more layers and layers. And that makes it qu quite challenging. And I think the challenge for me in particular in the digitization program office is that we are asking the units to provide a lot of information about what they do because we're trying to get a big picture view of what's happening. Um, and so there's been a lot of upfront work they've had to do at this point with them not yet quite seeing the benefit of that because that hasn't yet translated into funding or, or into a, a ramp up that they could feel like, well, you know, that was all worth it. Um, but what we tr how we try to keep everybody on board is to paint that picture to say, look, unless we have this data, unless we can tell this story, we will not be able to advance. And if we will not be able to advance, you will not be able to advance. And that seems to hold. And apart from that, everything else that Rebecca has said, all the decisions that get made, get made through, uh, in a very <coughs> representative way um, through committees and people buying, buying in. And that seems to help. Yeah, and we have three basic carrots that we're dangling in front of the researchers because they tend to be the, the hardest nut to crack. Um, the basic carrot is funding, uh, storage space. Um, mm -hmm. So we provide storage space to people who comply with the rules. Um, so we have you know, many terabytes worth of data, uh, or space available for them to use. 
And also we try to play the angle of preserving their legacy as a researcher. And that, you know, if something happens to them and their data is in these proprietary or, you know, spreadsheets on their desktop only, that their legacy as a scientist is going to go with them. So we're trying to kind of, I don't want to say appeal to their vanity, but that um, <laughs> for the good of science that they need to participate in um, these systems. That's been the most effective for us is money and storage. Um, I mean, ultimately, you, you're going to get people to work with you if they actually feel that by working with you or participating, their world changes for the better. And I think Thorny has been very good at making that case for the research repository, where he's basically saying, look, you should not even notice that you're depositing your data. This should just be part of your workflow. You know, you don't even, you're not taking an extra step to say, oh, now I'm wrapping up my project. Now I'm handing over this data. Now I have to fill out all these forms and I have to create metadata. No, that happens incidentally while you're actually going through your project. And voila, you've got your data deposited. You didn't even realize that that's what you were doing. That's just a side effect. So that's a nice model, I think. And if we can build on that in, in an abstract sense, you know, really allowing people to succeed in what they already want to do, uh, that'll work, I hope. Anybody else? I'm going to go with New York, and then you start. Are you guys planning on having a public wiki for the committee? Because I think one of the things people look towards about for Smithsonian is a public place for documentation, for strategy. Mm -hmm. I really value that perspective. I mean, mm -hmm. This presentation is a great form for that. Mm -hmm. But also being able to find that PDF on doing a search, I can share with a tweet, mm -hmm. and I can pass to colleagues that I can say this is a conceptual ground plan that you can begin to tackle because whether it's institution, big or small, these are this overall sense of <coughs> strategies that it's really needed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've stumbled upon other Smithsonian digitization documents mm -hmm. on the web, but it'd be nice if they were centralized in some place. As yeah, a I agree, and that's one place where we've sort of fallen down a little bit because we've been running so hard uh, that we've not been able to do that yet. But for the study I briefly mentioned um, that we're, we've just started to engage on, the plan is that there would be a public wiki for that. So as, as our folks in Office of Policy Analysis are putting together case studies, uh, they would share them. And hopefully, you know, if we're lucky, people would participate and actually feed some data back in. So they're quite excited and experimenting with that because they've never done that before. And um, they're looking into that as we speak. So I hope we can do that and make it a little more of a, of a two-way dialogue that way. Simon, you have a question? Okay. James. Uh, lessons learned about compromise. Um, I'd sort of follow up on that sort of ethos question, culture and bias. Mm -hmm. And so less on the scientific management, data mm -hmm. management side, but more catalogers. <coughs> Catal mm -hmm. Curators are perfectionists, catalogers are perfectionists, technology mm -hmm. people are perfectionists. Mm -hmm. And when you have that much content that you want to make available, trying to figure out where the right compromises are. And how, so what, what, have, what have you started to see about how to get people to see it, as you say, in some collective interest to compromise and where the right places to compromise are and aren't? Mm -hmm. Hmm. I, I'm drawing a little bit of a blank, and I think I'm drawing a blank because in a way we haven't drilled down to that level yet where people will have to compromise. At least, you know, Rebecca might have a story to tell about that. But in, in the work we're doing at the moment, it's mainly about telling that big story. And at that level, you don't, the negotiations are about what's on the table, what's off the table, but the units are negotiating that sort of internally. So we don't have to make those compromises yet. But um, if we start going down the path of, for example, uh, working on a prize, on a challenge, in order to issue a challenge and uh, have a prize purse, you need to very, very clearly specify what that party that wants to compete actually needs to deliver. And right there, in the preliminary conversations I've had with uh, with uh, one of the nonprofits that runs these kind of prizes, it's very clear you have to make trade-offs in what you're asking for. You can't ask for the moon, but 
you don't want to go too low and what is it, where is that sweet spot and right there I think we'll hit our first real negotiation of what will we tolerate so to speak what level of uh, perfection and imperfection uh, can we live with uh, and what are the trade-offs in terms of scale then so sorry that wasn't the that wasn't a good answer if I come up with something better I'll <laughs> I'll tug your sleeve that was true but it is a difficult it, it is a difficult one to answer for us because we're we're very large and we don't have a large staff by comparison to our size um, and so most of the conversations around the table about prioritization are not me um, I don't want to go first. I don't have the staff to do that right now. Um, so a lot of them are people kind of hoping someone else will do the first round and not them um, until they get funding. So it's kind of an opposite of what you would expect. Um, so they're kind of slowly getting voluntold rather than volunteering. Um. Last question. Yeah. So you've had all these random acts of digitization, so I'm guessing you have electronic records that are in all kinds of different states and then images that are in all kinds of different states and resolutions. So how do you balance? Are you just kind of accepting whatever's been done counts or do you have sort of minimum standards that you're trying to bring old records up to and old images up to or how are you balancing that? Uh, for us, we're taking everything that's already been done and then we're either converting it to a stable format um, and then we have like an assessment that basically says that these things are low quality or high quality and then that becomes part of the prioritization um, plan. Like when you're looking at it, you know, has it already been done before? Is it not good enough? Like what do we need to do? So that becomes part of the process. So when we look at that pan institutionally, when we assess, you know, has something done or is it not done? The way that works is that we say to the units, you tell us what your standard is. You know, if you say you have digital surrogates for something that you feel are adequate, what is that standard? What standard do they need to meet? And so each unit defines those standards for themselves, and then they say, you know, X percent of our collection meets that standard, another percentage is below, another percentage is above. So we we know that they're that they're hitting their sweet spot, but the sweet spots are different for each unit, and that's appropriate because you you do things differently when you're capturing um, you know airplanes at uh, air and space as opposed to when you're capturing paintings in the Freer Sackler or in the portrait gallery as opposed to when you're trying to shoot a locomotive in uh, in, in in American history so there's just with that variety we really had to build up a tolerance that there there cannot be a one size fits all but the measuring stick is you need to articulate your standard and you need to be true to that. Well, thank you all for your questions and thank you to the panelists.